It was formative in the last year. Yeah, that's not formative. You're already mostly formed. Uh, you know what? For me being 30, I feel remarkably unformed. Hi, everybody. I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. And this is the Concept Crucible Podcast. And today we talk about books. Yes. Again. You can never not... Talking about books is never a bad thing. Anybody who opinion. only talks about books once isn't worth your time. No. Yeah. Uh, so, um... Yeah, so we want to talk about the, the, the sort of narrative of our reading and, and, and how um, our reading has progressed and the th- kinds of things that we've learned from that mm-hmm. and the journey that our reading has taken us to learn about ourselves. Mm-hmm. But first, Icebreaker. Mm-hmm. And as with every single podcast about books, the Icebreaker is what is one of your formative books, mm-hmm. Ryan. When you say formative books, I'm actually going to interpret this as a collection of books. Mm. (laughs) Um, In the preparation for this podcast, we ended up going through the entire catalog of Goosebumps. And I realized, going through the list, like uh, until we hit, what, the last five to seven books, I had read and or owned the vast majority of them. And it and I was so full of just positive feels and and good associations. I can't, I'm just gonna lump R. L. Stein's Corpus of Goosebumps work and say that that was a formative book. If I had to choose one of them out of my out of my favorites, uh, I'd probably say, and I think it's called How I Got My Shrunken Head. Mm. Uh, that's the one that I remember reading the most and having a lot of fun with. Uh, and so yes, Goosebumps. Arl Stein, formative. Also, I, I will say that says something like very powerful about the the level of graphic design on those covers. Yeah, that that they immediately provoke that kind of recognition and response. Whoever designed those covers, well done. Yeah. Um. So for me, uh, I'm a cheater because I have a whole bunch of them on the shelf over there. Um. I am going to uh, go with a book I read as a grown up. Um. Even though I told Huck he couldn't. Yeah, I, I'm I'm secretly stewing because he's like, well, you're a fully formed adult. I, I was a fully formed adult at the time. I was maybe about 25. Yeah. Um, which is still almost 10 years ago. So, I mean, what else? Uh, 20, but 25 was not almost. I mean, yes. Rounding up from 5 to 10. Yes, I guess it is almost 10 years ago. What? We're going to have a discussion about my age after this. You're like, what? Tarty tree? Yeah. Um, so, uh... Yeah, my, my formative book is Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Mm. At least for today. And I love Heart of Darkness for a lot of reasons. I, I had to read it and, and, and write about it for a paper in a, a human studies course. Wait, like at St. Jerome's? Yep. I took that course. That's where really I read good, it too. It was a really good course. It was a really good course. Um, Green's. Yes. Uh, Green, Green's pen? No. Yeah. Green was his last. Yeah. Yeah, ah, that's so funny. It's a really good course, and and I read it, and I spent a lot of time really grappling with it. It was also, at the time, I think it was the longest paper I'd ever written, mm-hmm. and I was really nervous about it, and so I must have read that book, just during the course of, of writing that paper, I must have read it like ten times. It's not a very long book, mm-hmm. and I remember reading it so much that the the bits and pieces of the main plot sort of fell away. And what I was left with was um, a book that taught me a lot about being afraid and the kinds of things that people will do when they're afraid. Um, and it was interesting because I don't know that I ever read a book where where the hero was scared all the time and didn't, like, overcome that through courage, Mm -hmm. but simply, like, resolved to continue being fearful for the rest of their days. Mm -hmm. Um, where, Where it spoke to the notion of, like, a thing that lives inside people that they are fearful to release. And, uh, these were, these were concepts that I found, that I, I found sort of not just deeply motivating, but uh, like deeply off-putting, um, and that's without getting into anything regarding the, the the colonial context or 
the modern interpretations in, in Apocalypse Now, mm-hmm. uh, which we actually talk about in one of the last Saints Row videos. Oh, yeah? You know, we made an Apocalypse Now reference, and, mm-hmm. and I, I am continually intrigued that the, the Wagner uh, helicopter scene, which is the site of an atrocity, is is sort of like continually remembered as this badass thing or and, and has now situated itself in our cultural context so much that people will will hum Wagner while flying helicopters mm-hmm. without knowing the, the the origin of that, which seems perfectly fine. It's just it's it's that ingrained in our cultural context. And the origin of that comes out of um a bunch of, of people committing an atrocity. It was um, uh, Ride of the Valkyries, right? Yep. Yeah. And uh, but regardless, I mean, I mean, Heart of uh, Heart of Darkness is is formative for me in the sense that, yeah, it was the it was the first it was the first book I read where I, I, I think I got a really good look at um, what it meant to be scared all the time, and to be scared not just of and not in some sort of fantasy way, but 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 in in a in a method of, of reality, to be scared not of things outside you, but of things inside you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I wound up I wound up writing that in my paper as well, where I was like, you know, I I thought I was going to go into this, you know, being all like baller and brave and and resistant and resilient. And what I what I learned is that the stuff in this book scares me. Um, and these are the reasons why. I got an eye on the paper. I got a confession about that class. You didn't write the paper? Neither of the two papers. I still owe those two papers. And I met oh. him. I met him when I was in grad school. You monster. And, I, and you he, monster. Kind of, he kind of remembered me. And I'm like, I still owe you two papers. That was, that was the first time that I had the, the kind of terror of writing a paper after I'd already like past due and everything I just succumbed to that fear that I couldn't I couldn't bring myself to generate these papers I uh I did write both of those papers and uh I I don't know if they were some of the best papers I've ever written I bet if I went back and read them I'd be like oh really but they were interestingly self-aware I wrote about Heart of Darkness and Frankenstein yeah, I wanted to write about King Lear and Machiavelli. Not like one paper would be Machiavelli, one would be King Lear. Hmm. Um, and yep, yeah, no, uh, and I got like forty nine in that course. Like it was the only course I think I failed out of in university. Well, I can't imagine why. Yeah, two two of the it was like fifty percent of my grade. So yeah, otherwise I aced the course. Other than those two. <laughs> <laughs> Other than the part where I didn't hand in any of the work. Yeah. Thanks, but, Ryan. But in 50% of the course, I got 49%. So there you go. It says something. Of something. Anyway, things we read as children. You, I mean, <laughs> you you talked about Goosebumps as being like sort of your your starting point in self-directed reading. Yeah, because uh, when we when we were first doing the pre-show, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if this is for everybody, but when I reflect on the stuff that I was reading, there was a period before the self-directed reading where it was books that were introduced to me by parents and parental figures um, that were meant to try to kickstart the reading. And so the things like the Hardy Boys I was introduced to, I probably had a copy of, like a a proper copy of Robertson Crusoe, um, but instead I ended up reading like the the kind of children's picture book version of it that condenses Mm -hmm. the story down a little bit. Um, So I had exposure to those books, but it wasn't until I got into uh, Goosebumps and and uh, and another friend of mine had Goosebumps. So like we talked about it a lot. I joined the the Scholastic, like the the company Scholastic Mm -hmm. um, uh, Goosebumps fan club. You know, they got the (laughs) stickers and and the stuff like that. Uh, and then from Goosebumps, I ended up graduating on to Animorphs, and so really rode that series qu- uh, quite a way. Although I, I'm sad to say I never finished the series. I think I aged out of it before uh, before I ended up finishing the, the series. Uh, and then I had a long stretch where I wasn't really into any one particular thing other than, say, Calvin and Hobbes, because we had the collected anthologies. But I read a lot of the books assigned in school that I... They resonated with me enough that they've stuck with me that I remember reading them. I don't remember the plot, but I remember reading them. Things like The Giver, Hatchet, Pippi Longstockings, 
uh, Borges was probably the next one in line where that really resonated with me, and hmm. I, I consider Borges. Uh, it was the. Were we pinned down like an age on that? I'm just curious. Uh, I was introduced to Borges in grade eleven, I think. Oh, okay. Uh, it was. It was. I don't so know. Like late teen years. Late teen years. It was the circular ruins. Um, you know, a photocopy out of a book. Um, and that was the first time that I felt, and forgive the language, but the only way I can describe it is as a mind fuck. I read that story, and it was just, when I got to the ending and realized what Borges had did, it just went, the, the last, the only other time I had that feeling was when I discovered that light is consisting of red, green, and blue colors, which, because I'd always came up with the pigments of paint, right? But when I found out that if you combine red light, blue light, and green light, you get white light, my whole worldview just shattered. <laughs> Uh, and I and I had that with Borges so much so that when I got to or when I um, applied to university, I went to two other campuses and I went to the University of Waterloo. I had a friend of mine who went to school. We were the same age, but I stuck around for an extra year and he went ahead of me. So he was in first year and he gave me a tour around campus. We went through the bookstore. I'm like, oh, Borges. I remember reading that in, in school and I really liked it from my English class. And he bought me a copy of Borges' collected work, uh, Labyrinths uh, was the collection. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that started the tradition that whenever like a new person was going into university, like I would buy them a book as well to kind of like welcome them into, into the academy. Nice. Um, so yeah, there was Borges. But then, um, realistically, like the only thing in the middle there was when I finally picked up the Harry Potter series. And then, again, there was kind of this dark period in university where I wasn't reading anything other than the textbooks. And, and then, finally, then you end up with things like I'm starting to get into the Discworld series and, and other kinds of novels and stuff. That I'm, re, I'm kind of relearning or being reintroduced to fiction. Uh, yeah, because you spent like a year... Or two reading self help stuff, self help and... biographies, you know, th so, things about that. It's stri strictly in the nonfiction genre. So, so yeah, I think mine. I, I I was the opposite kid. I mean, in in the ways in which we are opposites, <laughs> um, which which is a lot. I think. Yeah. Um, is we didn't have TV when I was a kid, and I didn't have a lot of friends, and I read like voraciously by the time I was like three I would read anything and everything I read I, I remember scouring the house for books that I hadn't read when I was like five and I remember because I nearly knocked over a bookshelf because there was a underneath it uh, acting as a shim there was a math book, like just a little slim, like kids math book. And I, and I like, I was like trying to push the shelf back so I could slide out this book and read it. And, uh, yeah, I, I, anything and everything I could get my hands on, I would read. Uh, we didn't go to the library much when I was, when I was that young. And I hadn't yet been been introduced to used bookstores, but yeah, like yard sales, anything like that. Anytime we had spare cash, um, I would either spend it on candy or on books. Hmm. Um, and and you know, I would I would get toys for Christmas, and I I mean I had a lot of spare time, so I also played with a lot of toys. But books books were the thing that that would like occupy a wealth of time. And sort of the, the, the push-ups for my imagination. Mm -hmm. I remember tackling The Hobbit when I was like seven. Um, actually, the copy is still sitting on that shelf over there. Was, um, my mom's uh, boyfriend at the time was, was, he was into sci-fi. And I remember because he had a bunch of, like I remember the, Publishers. I remember the Tor and the Daw, um, like Burns on the books. Um, and so I spent a, like, like he had a whole bunch of books, and so I spent a bunch of time just like reading his books. Um, he did not have enough to like save me, but I read a I read a ton of stories. 
Uh, I also read Goosebumps books. I remember distinctly reading my last Goosebumps book in like the fifth grade. Mm -hmm. Because I was... I was at a different school for a while, and I was sit, I would instead of going out for recess, I would sit in the dark in the library because uh, they had a bunch. Uh, like I'd already read all the all the you know young adult fiction and and whatnot in the library at my old school. Um, so I would sit in their library because they had a bunch of, of books that I'd never seen before, mm -hmm. and I would I would every recess I would sit and read. Uh, until somebody found me, like, two weeks later, and was like, no, no, you have to go outside for recess. I'm like, but I'm reading. I remember grade three, I read The NeverEnding Story. And I remember being super proud, because it was like, it was it was in my school library, and it was like the thickest book I'd ever read. It's 26 chapters. Mm -hmm. Plus an epilogue. And I remember getting a copy, I had my own copy, which is still floating around this house somewhere. With these, like, awesome illustrations. I've still, I think, never seen the movie. But, yeah, like, I have, I have vivid memories of that book, which is ironically about a kid who reads too many books. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and who is undone by the power of his imagination. <laughs> so, it's kind of funny. But... Yeah, and by the time I hit, I think, the seventh grade, I had graduated to, I guess what I would refer to as grown-up books. Um, Murder Wise, Tracy Hickman, like, stuff like the Death Gate Cycle, Dragonlance books. Um, like, these are these are grown-up fantasy and sci-fi books that you would find in a bookstore or, or, or on a shelf, you know, where, like, three, four hundred pages a pop. Mm -hmm. And I never looked back. Mm -hmm. Like, I never... I think I, I think I went back to the, like kids section in the library once and like looked at some of the books that I had already read there of which there were many and I like pulled one out and I read it and I like just the size of the print threw me off and I was like why am I reading this and I walked back over to the grown up section I was like listen I'm fucking 11 I don't have fucking time for this <laughs> I have so many different series to track down this is all, I'm old. This is all pre-Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. Harry Potter wouldn't exist for another, I think, five years, six years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I mean, I mean, Dragonlance and Forgotten Realms and all those, all the D&D &D fiction was my jam. Mm -hmm. uh, I discovered used bookstores and the fact that, you know, I, I had an aunt and an uncle who loved used bookstores... And so we would go constantly, and I would acquire new books. And, yeah, like, I didn't, I don't know, I didn't graduate into what I would consider, like, literature until I was in my 20s. Mm -hmm. Like, 19, 1920, somewhere around there. Um, I remember reading Tom Jones by Henry Fielding and being like, this is, a, this is really good. And I read a ton more of it. Um, you know, Jane Eyre and Emma and all kinds of, like, just all kinds of, of, of classical lit. And I spent a bunch of time being enamored with, um, like, Elizabethan and Victorian and, and like, Regency-era Regency um, English lit. Mm -hmm. uh, I blame my friends. <laughs> and yeah, my... my yeah, like, my whole thing was, was just read books and never look back. Um, and every time I sort of moved on from... Like, like similarly with, like, Dragonlance and whatnot. I still have some of them, I think. Um, there's one sitting on the shelf from my, from my uncle's collection just over there. But... Like, I, under, I understand them to the degree that I would never need to read them again. Like, like they have taught me... If they haven't taught me everything they have to teach me, they have, they have taught me everything I'm going to learn. Mm -hmm. And I have moved on to, to the next thing. And I, I spent, I think, a lot of time, like, looking at reading as leveling up. And sort of, sort of looking to the books, the books that I saw the adults around me reading, mm -hmm. and wondering what those books were like. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the answer is sometimes they're super boring. Like I've also read a bunch of shitty airport spy books. 
<laughs> Tom Clancy and Clive Cussler and um, like Robert Ludlum. Just books full of like lots of bullshit toxic masculinity <laughs> that I'm not a super fan of. But I mean, I had this idea that books make you who you are, or at least they were going to make me who I was. Mm-hmm. So I needed to, to read as many of them as I could. Mm-hmm. And eventually you just become the kid that reads stuff. Until you discover video games. Yeah. Then all bets nothing, off. nothing puts a dent in your reading like video games. <laughs> yep. But not having a TV and not having a lot of friends, that'll, uh, that'll kit you right out for, for being the kid who reads stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, YouTube and Netflix and whatnot is now the bane for, for reading for me. It's easy to fall down a YouTube hole. <laughs> but so I mean, you talk about some of the stuff you read as an, you you read as an adult, like you mm-hmm. spent a couple of years reading self help books and and system deconstruction books. Yeah, and uh, I don't think I'm immune to what happens, but I think what ends up happening with adults is um, as everything else forces itself into your life, you start reading purely for utility. And I don't think this is true of everybody, because I know some people who read um, who read fiction and whatnot because they, they do it for the enjoyment, but I find that more often than not you run into people who will claim or be self-claiming that they don't really read a lot anymore, and when they do read it tends to be more utility-based. It's stuff that's relevant to their interests, it's stuff that, you know, they, they've been told that they should read, and, and like I said, it's not for everybody, but... Um, I do, I do tend to find that. And I, and so, yeah, in the last year, relatively speaking, I became a fairly prolific reader, at least relative to, you know, before that. But, um, you know, I was primarily reading nonfiction and books that I found were either self-help or things that were going to help me, um, in, you know, like economics or business, but a lot of this, a lot of them were self-help books, you know, um. Um, creating systems in your life to be able to to handle things better, you know the Stephen Coveys mm-hmm. and uh, um, Dale Carnegie's. Dale Carnegie. Well, no, I didn't read Dale Carnegie last year. Oh. I started reading it at one point. Uh, Robert Greene, the Forty Eight Laws of Power. Um, Robert Cam, I think is his name. He runs a blog called. Um, Oh wow! Uh, the book was "Level Up Your Life." His his nerd fitness is mm. is his site. Um, Ramit Sethi's um, "I Will Teach You to Be Rich." Mm. You know, so I, I read a lot of those books in the last year, or at least last year, um, just purely on trying to you know gain insight or gain some sort of magic bullet that will, that will help solve the problems that I have. So, um, but things are. are you know, starting to kind of change around for me a bit in that I started drifting more towards fiction. Um, I'm enjoying fiction on audiobook because it's like somebody telling me a story. I know somebody Mm. leveled a criticism at me that, um, you know, audiobooks are not good for reading. And I think if you're trying to gain information, it's really easy with a nonfiction book for you to put it on and do something else. You can drive, you can do dishes, you know, you can be doing exercising or something. Yep. And your your consciousness or your, your conscious attention is kind of vaguely tuned in. You come in and out. Um, you get the gist of it, but you're not necessarily attentively paying attention to it. But I find with fiction... You, the same thing happens, but I enjoy it far more when it's a fictional work because it's somebody telling a story to me. And I just finished uh, The Color of Magic by Terry Pratchett, which is the first book in the, the Discworld series. Yep. Um, and, and I enjoyed the hell out of that book. It was such fun. So it was very witty, very funny, very clever. The way he describes and creates a kind of universe or science of the magic just very very enjoyable to listen to so yeah I, I can't do audiobooks for exactly that reason is that is that if i miss pieces of the fiction i stop understanding what's happening and i have to go back mm-hmm. um yeah like i i am pretty much uh exclusively reading science fiction and fantasy books from my my uncle's old collection and 
I'm pulling them off semi off the shelf like semi randomly. I'm also only reading books by women, uh, as I have been for the past like two or three years, um, which I'm finding really fun. Because I, I read a bunch of books by dudes and was like, uh, I've never really been super discretionary. Maybe I'll act with a bit more discretion. I mean, I'm discretionary about what food I put in my body. I should be discretionary about, like, what, you know, books I put in my brain. And it's funny that like, you, you mentioned reading for utility. I, I I would make an argument that I almost never read for utility um, because anything, any, like, practical skill I need to learn, I would learn from watching videos. Mm -hmm. But arguably reading is also, for me, a, a utility thing because it exercises my imagination. Mm -hmm. What I need are books that take symbols and invent symbols and manipulate symbols in interesting and unique ways. And fiction is where is is where I can get that to happen. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I spend a lot of time. I mean, because it improves my D and D game and it improves my storytelling abilities in general and it mm -hmm. gives me ideas to create content and. Mm -hmm. All the rest of that. And that's not stuff I usually get from nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Although I do have a couple of nonfiction books sort of earmarked on my shelf for when I get some time. But uh, I'm not going to be picking up, like, I don't know. I was about to say The Divine Comedy, and then I realized that uh, The Divine Comedy is, in fact, a work of fiction. What? No, it's you, not. It arguably, is nonfiction no, all no, the way The Divine through. Comedy is not merely a work of fiction. It is a work of fan fiction. <laughs> first fan fictions uh, I don't even think that's remotely true no probably not <laughs> just none of those really ex are carried forward eh, Ovid's Metamorphosis is fan fiction it's deeply erotic fan fiction deeply erotic if you have a very particular sense of what constitutes the erotic mm. um, but uh, yeah I think that the, the things that I read now I am still leveling up mm -hmm. my, my sort of reading ambition is not just read more um or read with more discretion but also read more contemporary work there's a lot to be said for reading books that are coming out now whose authors are active now and in the co in a context where lots of other people are reading them like i i, I mentioned harry potter i missed the whole harry potter thing mm -hmm. and by the i think i was like i might have been like 20 when it came out it came out in uh, 98, I think. Okay, so I would have been 15. Right. Um, and, I, and I was just, I was, yeah, because I remember the, the, the big craze hitting when I was like 18. And I remember, I, w I was in a state where I was, I was deeply interested in not liking stuff that other, pe that other people liked. Um, which is a really foolish position to have. Mm-hmm. But, uh, so I never actually read Harry Potter until years later, and I read the first book. I still read all of it. I read the first book, and I was like, okay, like, this is, this is, like, I understand why it's super mind-blowing. It's like, it reminds me of Dresden Files. Um, I understand why it's, like, super revolutionary for people who've never picked up a book like that, or, or have only picked up a couple of books like that. Like, it's, it's, it's pretty good. I mean, mm -hmm. it's pretty interesting mm -hmm. and it yeah, i mean the journey of harry potter is definitely the also the journey of of rowling like maturing as a writer mm -hmm. um because it definitely gets better i've read uh two or three of the books at this point mm -hmm. um, but i have not read the last one and but as somebody who who had read even at that point easily a thousand books about wizards the notion of one additional book about wizards did not particularly motivate me. Mm -hmm. um, in the same way that, yeah, like I remember a buddy of mine trying to get me into Dresden Files. And Dresden Files, let me tell you, is good. Mm -hmm. The world building is good. The characters are interesting. The magic system is is um, really cool and really intricate. There's a there's a huge mythology. Like they like it's it's juicy. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you. If you were looking for, like, contemporary urban fantasy, you could do a lot worse than Jim Butcher's Dresden Files. Mm -hmm. But I remember reading it and going, I'm full up on this right now. 
I'm full up on wizards in overcoats in cities in contemporary times who are bad with technology and worse with women who make routinely bad decisions like like there's this laundry list of of facts about the main character and and the sort of situations they got them who solve mystery like occult mysteries uh and speak with the dead like i'm just like i'm full up on this because i was also reading um Hellblazer at the time, which is the the comic series uh, about John Constantine, mm-hmm. who is a wizard who fits exactly that description, mm-hmm. <laughs> but is British. Mm-hmm. Um, I was reading a book. Uh, I, I color color not color of magic. Uh, name of magic, um, which uh, includes a lot of that stuff. Like it's, I'm just like I'm thinking about it. And I'm like I like I, I remember telling telling my friend. I'm just like I understand that you really love these books, and it's I read the first one. It's really good. But I'm full. <laughs> I am full on this genre. At the moment. And I do not have space for more. Uh, which is a weird thing to say. But yeah, like it's, I have read so many of those books. That... Um, like, the, the I, I don't know. I got bored with a bunch of the, the like tropes. Which I guess is, is a thing. Trope fatigue, you might call it. Yeah, but I want to read more contemporary work. Um, I want I want to read work that works that uh, my friends who are also into books are reading. I want to read uh, more work by women and people of color. I want to write about that that work, and I'm excited to do so. Uh, but I also need that means I need to like start going to more bookstores. Mm-hmm. How about you? What are you? What are your reading ambitions? Like you're, 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 you just, you just, you just got color of magic under your belt. Yeah. Uh, so, I guess back up a little bit. Um, the the impetus to read um, more books starting last year came from the year before when I realized at the end of the year I had only read say two and a half books, and one of the books that I had read was The Republic of Imagination by Azar Nafisi. I had first encountered her on the CBC. Uh, Anna Maria Tremonti had her on as a guest of The Current and interviewed her. Mm-hmm. And I was just listening to her talk um, and just kind of had a intellectual crush on her uh, mm-hmm. from that conversation. Legit. So I ordered the book as kind of a birthday gift for myself and, uh, and I, I worked my way through it. And I craved to love reading literature the way she did. Ooh, the Republic nice. of Imagination is an interesting book because she only talks about three books. Uh, Huck Finn for like 50% of the book, a James Baldwin book, and there's one other one, I can't remember it. But also a lot of the Republic of Imagination was, I thought it was going to be a little bit more of a lit analysis, uh, but actually uh, the stories that she was writing about was framing devices for talking about a friend of hers who I believe passed on before the publication of the book. Mm. So there was this kind of dual th- uh, dual nature going on there. Um, but she talked about teaching Lolita in Tehran in kind of an underground reading group with a bunch of young women. And so the book was banned, and certainly young women were banned from, from reading stuff like that. Um, you know, she just loves literature. And so I, I kind of, in addition to just wanting to read more, um, I want to be the kind of person that loves literature in a way that she does. Now, obviously, for me to read kind of douchey, nonfiction, self-help books and whatnot doesn't exactly help that, um, which is why I'm starting to slowly come into uh, reading more fictional works. You know, I started Neil Gaiman with um, American Gods, uh, Terry Pratchett. Uh, I do want to start reading more stuff uh, that I guess would be deemed literature and canon, but it's not necessarily the end goal. Although my stretch goal is I bought a copy of War and Peace, and I want to try reading that. That's a big behemoth, and given the way it was written, it's going to be an interesting, different narrative structure. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's, that's kind of, if I had a to articulate the reading ambition it would probably something be along those lines of shifting away from nonfiction as the primary source and delving more into stories 
loving literature. And one of the things we talked about was uh, I want to get better at reading books for meaning rather than just plot and narrative. And your suggestion is read the book three times minimum. Let <laughs> let the plot draw, uh, fall away and so you can start making connections between ideas and symbols. Um, and this is one regret that I have out of university is that I probably didn't take nearly enough literature courses to, to have a little bit of that guidance to help me through it. But I have friends that are more than happy to help me out. And there's lots of <laughs> Uh, resources <laughs> online with YouTube and Coursera and everything else. So I've got it covered. It's just I need to carve out the time to do that. But um, So, yes, I, I want to be the kind of person that reads for enjoyment and reads... When I say reads to improve myself, it's not from the nonfiction point of view. It's from the fictional point of view. Mm. In, embodying other people's stories, embodying their worlds... Um, and I like the the metaphor that you used of, you know, essentially pull-ups for your mind when you're talking about reading heavy books and whatnot. Specifically for my imagination. Yeah, for your imagination. So I, uh, I'll, steal a, I'll steal a line from uh, Widowmaker Reborn uh, by Mike Resnick. There's a character in there who says, when, when the, the, the protagonist criticizes her for having too much fiction on her shelves <laughs> to be a politician she says fiction teaches you about people yeah so those are my ambitions fun yeah send us your reading list yes please more more reading suggestions down below yeah um and uh, while we are reading you can leave comments here or on the audio version on the blog post mm -hmm. and uh, we will get them because that's how that works. Also, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Yep. And you can also check out our Patreon account. Yes, we, we've if you would like got... to support yep. this podcast and the music that we make and the uh, co-op adventures and other video game videos that we do, uh, you can now do that. Mm -hmm. All the information, box down below. Yeah, that, that sound indicates for listeners that it is in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway... I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. And we're signing off. Stay awesome. Yeah, let's do the thing. Let's do it. Get a show on the road. Hi, everybody. I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. And we're... This is the... <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that. Dude. I think I was I was in co-op adventures mode because I'm like, we're playing... Wait, no. No, 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 no. We're playing podcasts. We're not playing podcasts. All right. All right, let's try that again.